Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Merv. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as we play through the first out of three overall rounds. Now, I would like to ask that if you end up enjoying this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with nice bonuses like voting on a few of the videos that I film each month. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I might make mistakes as I am showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Now in the middle of the table we have a board, and this represents the city of Merv. Now this is a very old city. It was established thousands of years ago, and it flourished between the 6th and 13th centuries AD. Now the setting of this game puts us in the 12th century AD, and right around the corner the Mongols are planning on raiding, and they will ultimately be the downfall of this city. That being said, the Mongols are not here just yet, and at this moment this is actually the largest city in the world with a population of almost 1 million. The reason Merv became so large and successful is because it was a hub of trade along the Silk Road and it was the gateway between the East and the West. Now within this large bustling city, players are trying to be as successful as they can as they interact with various parts of the city, and they also must make preparations for the oncoming Mongol raids. Now mechanically, what players are doing in this game is moving their master meeples around the outside of the city. Now when you move, you'll go to an open spot in the next section in front of you, and once every player has done an action, you will then move all of them into the corner and then do the same thing as you go down the next side. Once we complete four rounds, that will finish a year, and there are three years in the game. That means each player is only going to take 12 turns total before the game is over. Now as players activate these tiles, they will be able to construct their own buildings on these tiles, which will make future activations more lucrative within given rows and columns for them, as well as potentially for their opponents. Now there are many different locations in this city that players can visit. The palace down here lets them get victory points for doing a wide variety of things. The mosque is a long track which can give a wide variety of bonuses. And up here you can construct walls that will go down around the outside of the city in order to help defend against the Mongol raids. Players can also visit the library to pick up scrolls which will give them various bonuses. And you can also do trading over here on the Silk Road, heading out from Merv into other cities where they can trade for common or rare goods. The final zone is the Caravansary, and this lets players pick up spices which can be worth a significant amount of points at the end of the game, and they can also give them in-game benefits as they are playing when they make pairs of specific types of spices. Now obviously there is quite a bit going on here, and I will explain the details of each of these individual sections as we bump into them while we are playing. Now I think we are ready to start playing the game, and for today's tutorial, we are going to be playing as the red player. Now we are actually the starting player, so at this point, let's now take the first turn of the game. With this in mind, let's focus on the center of the board some more, and in particular over here in the top left corner. As you can see, each player has a master figure, and ours is at the front of the line, and that's how we know that we are going to be the starting player. So this means we can take our turn, and every player's turn is split into four overall steps that we will perform in order before the next player in line gets to take their turn. Now the first step involves choosing an action slot. When you do this, you have to move your master to an open spot from the up to five options that are showing on the next side of the city that is clockwise from where the masters are. Since the masters are starting here, that means we are going to be accessing this quarter of the overall city in this round, and that means we can simply move this onto any empty spot. As you can see, the arrows do show the clockwise pattern. Now we are not allowed to place beyond this corner, so we have to pick one of these, and I think let's go right over here. Next up, we can move into the second step of our turn, where we can choose a building site to activate. The way this works is we will find all of the building site options that are in a line associated with our master. Now when the master is at the top or the bottom of the city, then they are going to be looking at these columns, and if the master is over here on the right or left side, they will instead be looking at this row. Now as far as the game terms are concerned, you just call the set of building sites available to you the active row, whether you are on the top or on the side. So that means this is the active row right over here, and each one of these tiles is a building site. It's worth noting this central tile right here is not technically a building site, and I'll explain the details of how this works later on in the tutorial. 
So we now have to select one of these options, and I think we want to select this building site right here. The next thing that we have to do is check to see if there is a building token on the site that we have selected. In this case, there is not, and that means we have to take one of our own building tokens and we place it down onto that site. It's worth noting that there could have already been one of our buildings over there, in which case we would not add anything, and you are also allowed to activate sites that have buildings on them of other players' colors. Now, I will explain what happens when you activate an opponent's building site very soon. After building, we can now move into the third step of our turn, where we are going to generate resources. The first thing that we have to do for this is generate the resources associated with the specific building site that we have activated. As you can see, every building site has a resource color in the bottom right corner, and this one shows tan. So that means this building site is going to generate one tan resource for us. Now, I do want to mention these upgrades right over here. There are a few ways to place these down onto the building sites, and I'll explain that later, but let's just pretend this upgrade was already on that building site. Now, this type of upgrade simply generates another associated resource. So now, if we selected this building site, we would make a teal resource as well as one tan resource. The other option looks like this, and that covers up the pre-printed resource on the tile, and that means in the future, whenever this generates resources, it makes a single white resource, and this is wild, which means it can be spent as any of the other color types in the game. Well, let's focus out, and of course, in this instance, we are just going to make one tan resource. Now, the next thing that we have to do is take a look at all of the other building sites that are in the current active row. Now, what we're looking for is another building site that has a building on it that matches the color of the building that's on the spot that we activated for this turn. So, for the purpose of example, let's pretend we had a red building down here. Now we can tell there's a red building on the building site that we activated, so that means all other building sites with red buildings within the active row will also generate resources. So in this example, we would generate a teal, and if, for instance, this upgrade was right over there, then that would actually generate us two teal, even though this is the building site tile that we are activating this turn. This means it's quite advantageous to have many buildings within a given row on this board. If it wasn't like that, then by selecting this, we would make a tan, another tan, a purple, and a teal, which is obviously a lot more than the single tan that we have generated so far on this turn. Before we move on, I would now like to talk about what happens if you select a building site that has an opponent's building on it. So for the case of example, let's pretend we selected this building site right over here with a blue building on it. Now, in this case, we are going to generate one purple because that is the type of resource on this spot. And then we will also generate a tan because once again, we will generate resources on all building sites within the active row that have a matching building color token on them. Now, in addition to that, when you activate a building site with an opposing building on it, your opponent will also be able to generate resources on the activated site. So that means in this example, as I said, we would get a purple and a tan, but the blue player would just get a purple. They do not get to take the standard resources on the other building tiles in the active area that have their buildings on them. Now, I did mention these upgrades before, and if there are upgrades on other building sites with the matching color, then your opponent does actually generate those. So once again, in this example, if we activated this, we would get a purple, a tan, and a teal, and the blue player would get a purple and a teal, because once again, they don't generate resources on the other tiles, but they do generate resources from upgrades on those building tiles. Now, obviously, this is not the case. At the moment when we generate resources, we are simply going to take one tan because this is the only building site with a red building on it in this active row. Well, we've now reached the fourth and final step of our turn where we can perform a single action from three overall options. The first action option involves simply gaining one favor. The way you do this is you move your token forward once on this favor track, and if you reach any of these spots that show the victory point icon, you immediately take that associated number of victory points. Now, there are many ways to gain favor in the game, and whenever you see a turban icon like this, that means you gain one favor on the track. It's worth noting, if your token ever reaches the end of the track and you gain more favor, then you will instead gain one influence, which is tracked up along here, and I'll talk about the influence track in more detail later on in the tutorial. Now, this is not the action that we want to do for our turn, so we can put this back to zero. This means we can now talk about the second action option, which involves taking a servant token and placing it down onto a building site as a soldier. 
As you can see, every building site has a shield with the servant icon on it. So for our entire action, we could place this right over here, and that building site would then be protected from the next Mongol invasion. It's worth noting that whenever you put a soldier down onto a site that has your building on it, you will gain one influence on the upper influence track. And if you put a soldier down onto a site that has an opponent's building on it, you will instead get two influence on the influence track. Now, I don't think this is what we want to do on our turn either. So let's now look to the third option. And that involves performing the board action that is printed in the top right corner of the building site that you selected earlier on in the turn. As you can see, this is the tile we selected, and the building site action shows the caravansary icon. Now this is going to be our main action for the turn, so let's now go to the caravansary, which is represented by the eight cards that are face up along the right hand side of the board. Now before we look at these cards in detail, I'd like to focus over here, because this shows us the details of how we perform the action. As you can see up here, it says we can spend any number of resources, but they all have to be the same. And for every resource that we spend, we can take one spice card from the caravansary row. Now down below, this tells you which spice card options you can take from the row. What this is saying is that you can take any spice card that currently has a camel token on top of it. And you can also take any spice card that is adjacent to a spice card that has a camel token on top of it. When we focus out, you can see that in a three-player game, there is a camel on the three farthest spice cards away from the spice draw deck. Now, at the moment, we have a single resource, and we can spend as many as we want, but obviously that is going to be just one. Uh, once again, they all have to be the same type, but when you're spending one, that is obviously the case. Now, since we spent one resource, we can now take one spice card from the row. And once again, we can only take from a card that has a camel token on it or from a card that is next to a camel token. So that means these four are currently our only options. When we focus in more, our options are pepper, juniper, ginger, or another pepper. Now, these camel tokens are pretty nice to have. And if you take a spice card that has a camel token on it, then you get to keep that camel token. So I think in this case, let's go ahead and take this pepper spice card, and then we can take the camel that is on top of it. So we can add this pepper into our area as well as this camel. But before we move on, I would now like to talk about the restrictions on which of these spices we are allowed to take. Now at the start of the game, players are only allowed to have a single type of spice in front of them. We have taken pepper, which means we have committed to pepper being our current only spice that we can take. That means if we had more tan resources, the only other option we'd have right now would be taking this other pepper right here because we cannot take a ginger or a juniper because each of those would be a second type of spice. With this in mind, I would now like to focus up on the influence track where you can see a few different icons underneath it, but in particular, I'd like to focus on these three over here. Now this shows two X and then a equal sign with a slash through it on the spices. That means if we are able to get our influence up to this level, then we now have the ability to have two different spices in our area. Now you can have as many of each of these spices as you want, but this uh, track right here is going to unlock the ability to take more spices. So there are four total spices in the game. And if you want to have at least one of each, you're going to need to get your influence all the way up to this spot right over here. So for the moment, until we get our influence up to the fourth location, we are not allowed to take any non-pepper spices into our area. Now the final point I'd like to make about taking spice cards is what happens every time you have two of the same type in your area. As you can see on this card, it shows two pepper cards and then a bonus, which lets you put down one of these upgrades, which will make a building site create a wild white resource instead of the one printed on that tile. That means every time we get a pair of pepper, we can place one of those upgrades out. So if we are able to find a way to take this, that would let us get an upgrade, which would certainly be good. Now, each of the different spices have a different pair bonus. As you can see, if you get two ginger, that will let you deploy a soldier out into the city. And it's worth noting, if you get a uh, third and fourth ginger, then when you get that fourth one, you can once again deploy another soldier. Now, likewise, this cinnamon over here lets you get a wild resource every time you make a pair. And the final option is juniper, which will give you one favor every time you make a pair of that spice. Now, I suppose I haven't talked about the numbers at the bottom of these spice cards just yet. This is end game victory points that we get for making different sets of these cards. And I'll talk about that in more detail later on. Now for our action, obviously we just spent one resource. We have now taken our one spice and our action is over. 
This means we can now reset this market by sliding everything down, and then we will draw new spices from the top of the spice deck. Well, at this point, we have finished the fourth and final step of our turn. Now, I would like to mention that either before or after we take our main action, we do have the ability as a bonus action to claim one of these contracts, but I'll talk about the details of claiming these contracts later on in the tutorial. Uh, we are not taking any right now, and at this point, our turn is over. That means we can look up here to the city, and the blue player can now take their first turn of the game. After thinking through their options, blue decides to head all the way over to this spot, and that means this is their active row. They have to select one of these building sites, and they are going to go with this one here. It does not have a building on it, so they can construct their own building, and then they will generate resources. This is going to generate a teal resource for them, and there are no other blue buildings on any of the building sites in this active row, so that's the only resource they'll be generating. This means it's time for them to take their action, and they have decided to take the action that's printed on the building site that they activated, which is the marketplace action. Now the first thing that Blue gets to do for this action is establish a new trading route. This lets them place a disc down into a city connected to Merv or connected to one of their previously placed discs. And they've decided to place this over into bulk. Now as you can see there is a camel on this spot and that means the first player to place here along with all of the other close cities will take a camel as a reward. Now it's worth noting that in the future, players are allowed to place their discs down onto spots that have previous discs, and there is no penalty for that, but there is obviously a reason to be in there first, because these four spots will give you a camel. And also, once you have a trading spot next to Merv, on a future marketplace action, you can place another one of these tokens onto the farther city as you follow that path. Now the first player to place into each of the farther out cities will be able to gain one favor. Now that Blue has constructed a single trading post, it's time for them to move into the second half of the marketplace action, which lets them purchase up to one time with each of the eight cities. Now, in order to purchase with a city, you either have to have a marketplace token on it, or you have to spend camels to gain access to that city. Now, the way this works, as you can see down here, is you can place a camel on the road between Merv and a city where you do not have a trading post in order to then be able to trade with that city. So right now, the blue player would be able to trade with Bulk as well as Samarkand because they put their camel here. Now likewise, they could put this camel over there, and that means on this turn, they could trade with Bulk as well as Peshawar because this camel is connecting them. If you happen to have more than one camel, you can also place a camel here and there in order to trade with Samarkand and Kashgar, even if you don't have trading posts in either of those cities. Now this is going to spend the camel, and at this point, the blue player decides it makes more sense to hold onto this single camel. The reason for that is because currently blue has just one resource, and it is teal. Now that matches up with the resource that the city bulk wants, so they can spend this in order to trade with bulk once. Now whenever you trade with a city, you are either going to take a common good or a rare good based off of which city you are trading with. As you can see, Bulk has the Grapes common good, and it's worth noting that each of these tokens is mechanically the same, even though thematically they have different common goods on them. In the same way, whenever you trade for a rare good, which costs two resources, you can take the one that matches the city you traded with, but all of these different types are mechanically the same type, which is a rare good. Well, the blue player has now finished all of the purchases they're planning on doing, so that means that the last thing they have to do as part of the marketplace action is place any spent camels over here onto the spice cards. Now, obviously, blue did not spend any camels, but if, for example, they had spent a camel onto any one of these roads, they would then take all of the camels that were spent, and they would then place them down one at a time onto the spice cards that are farthest away from the deck, and also next to a card that already has a camel. So if, for instance, they had spent this over here, they would then put this right over here because that's the first card in this line that does not have a camel on it. In this way, when players take the marketplace action, they will actually be manipulating the different spices that players have the opportunity to purchase when they go to the caravansary. Now, obviously, the blue player did not spend their camel, so they can take this back into their supply, and at this point, their turn is over, so now yellow can go. After considering their options, yellow has decided to head over here. Now that means this is the active row, and they would like to activate this building site. As you can see, it does not have a player building on it yet, so they can construct their own building on it, and then they can generate resources here, which is going to give them a tan resource, and then they don't generate anything else because obviously there are no other yellow buildings within the active row. After that, it's time for their action, and they've decided to activate the action on the tile they activated, which is the wall construction area. 
As you can see, that is up at the top of the board and it shows many different wall sections and four different gate tokens. Now, in order to purchase any of these, they have to spend the associated resources. And for this action, they can build as many pieces as they want and that they can afford. Now, at the moment, the yellow player has a single tan resource. So that means they could spend this in order to purchase this wall piece right over here. Obviously, they would probably like to construct more wall pieces, but they cannot afford it because they only had one resource. Now, these wall pieces are going to go around the outside of the city of Merv. As you can see, they go into the spots that look like this, but then the central row and column in Merv has a different icon, and you can only place a gate over there. And as you can see, the gates always cost three resources each. Now, in this case, it looks like the yellow player wants to place this wall right over here. And then after placing this, they can gain influence. If you look right over here, it shows a wall or gate piece and then two tiles. And that means we look at the next two tiles in the row or column associated with where the wall went down. Now, for every one of that player's buildings on the spot, they are going to gain one influence. And for every opposing building that's in those two, they will gain two influence. So if it was like this, they would get one, two, three influence. But obviously, the blue player did not play over there yet. So right now, they will just gain one influence for placing this wall. So the yellow player can take one influence, which is tracked up here. Well, that's finished up the yellow player's turn. And I do want to mention that the reason that players build walls is not only to gain influence, but also to protect various buildings from the Mongol raids that are coming on later in the game. Now, I will explain the details of how a Mongol raid works later on in this tutorial. Well, at this point, there are no masters left in the corner, which means that this round has come to an end. That means it's time to move these masters into the next corner of the board so that we can proceed to the following round. And the way this works is we start with the master that is farthest away from the next corner. Now that token is going to be placed on the farthest left turn order spot. That means that we are going to go third in the next round. However, there is something that we can do about this. Now we do have a camel in our supply, and when we place this onto a spot, we could choose to spend a camel on a location that we do not want to put our master onto to then go to the next location over. So we could spend our camel to go here, which guarantees we will go second in the next round, but then whichever player goes onto this spot will gain that camel as a reward. It's worth noting that right now, if the yellow player went, they could place a camel of their own on top of this to then be in first, and then there would be two camels there, both of which would go to the blue player, who would then be going third in the next round. Now, I don't think it actually makes sense for us to spend our camel. There are some better ways to use this, and I don't think turn order matters that much early on in the game, so we will hold on to this and go third in the next round. Now we can see we go to the yellow player. They are going to go into the second place spot. They don't even have a camel to go here if they wanted to go first in the next round instead. So they're going second, and that means the last thing that we do is move the blue player over here. And at this point, we can start the next round where we are all going to move our masters down the eastern edge of the city. So blue can go, and they're going to put their master right over here. That means this is going to be the active row, and they would like to activate this building tile here. Now that does not have any player buildings on it, so they can put their own building down, and now they can generate resources. So this is going to give them a tan resource, and then there is another blue building within the active row, and that means that is going to generate a teal resource for them, so they will get two resources total. Next up, it's time for them to take an action, and they are going to go with the board action that's printed on the tile they activated. Now this icon is for the library action. The way this works is players can spend one to four different resources in order to take one to four scrolls from the supply. At the moment, the blue player has a tan and a teal resource. Those are both different, and they have decided to spend both of those right now, and that will give them two scrolls from the supply. As you can see, there are slightly different writing styles on the scrolls, but they are all mechanically identical. So blue can place these in front of them, and then whenever players get scrolls, they have to check to see if they are now eligible for a new breakthrough. As you can see, there are four different stacks of breakthrough tiles, and you can take one tile from one of these stacks as soon as you have the indicated number of scrolls. Currently, the blue player has two scrolls, and that is enough for them to achieve a first level breakthrough because this shows a 2x scroll icon on the back. Now that means the blue player can look at all four of these options and then choose one of them to keep for the rest of the game. And then they'll put the rest back over here for one of their opponents to take. It's worth noting you are never allowed to take more than one breakthrough tile of a specific color. 
So the blue player can choose one of these first level breakthroughs, and they have an infinity symbol on the top to show they will keep this as an ongoing effect for the rest of the game. Now, each one of the first level breakthroughs gives you a single resource discount when performing the associated action on that tile. In this case, Blue decides they would like a discount when performing the Mosque action, so they can place this face up in front of them and then put the other breakthrough tiles back over here into the supply. At this point, Blue is done, but before we move on, I'd like to show you what the second, third, and fourth level breakthroughs look like for the scrolls. Now, the second level ones will all give you the ability to spend a specific resource color as if it was wild for the rest of the game up to one time per turn. So this lets you be much more flexible with a specific type. If you had this one, then once per turn, you could spend a purple as if it was any other resource type. Next up, there are the third breakthroughs, which you get once you have six scrolls. And each of these are a immediate one time use effect. As you can see, this one right here lets you place a trading post and then take a common or rare good for free from that associated spot. This one lets you move up the mosque track once without paying for it. This one lets you build a wall or gate once without paying for it. And this one lets you take any spice card from the row without paying for it. If it has a camel, you get the camel, but it is worth noting you are still restricted to a certain number of spice types based off of your current influence level. After that, the final set are the 4th level breakthroughs, which require 8 scrolls. And as you can see, these are also one-shot abilities. This one gives you 2 favor, this gives you 8 points immediately, that one gives you 2 soldiers, which help you fight back the Mongol raids, and the final one gives you a soldier and a favor. Alright, I did say Blue's turn is over, which means it's the yellow player's turn, and they are going to go right here. That's going to make this the active row, and they would like to activate this building site here. That does not currently have a building on it, so they can construct one of their own, and then when they generate resources, this is going to give them an orange resource, and the other one will give them a tan resource. After this, it's now time for yellow to take their action, and they've decided to perform the board action that's printed on the activated tile. Now this shows the palace, which is in the bottom middle part of the board. Now within the palace, there are four different areas, and within each of these, there are three slots that can take a courtier. Now, we are going to have a scoring after each of the game's three years, and the main way we will get points is from courtiers over here within the palace. Courtiers over here will give points based off of the number of steps you've gone up on the mosque. Courtiers here will give you points for the number of common and rare goods that you have. Next up, courtiers over here will give you one point for each spice card you have. And lastly, courtiers over there will give you one point for each scroll that you have. Now, during the scorings, you are going to have to spend favor for each courtier that you would like to score, and I'll talk about the scorings in more detail later. For the moment, the yellow player can now add courtiers to the palace, and they can place as many as they want to and that they can afford. As you can see, the cost to place a courtier into each of these areas is printed at the bottom, and the number of that resource you have to spend is equal to the number of courtiers you will have in the palace once you place the new one. That means when they put their first one down, that is going to cost a single one of these associated resources, and right now the yellow player has tan and orange. This means they could place over here or there, and at the moment they don't have any goods, and they've not gone up the mosque track, but they think they are more likely to go up the mosque track, so this is the spot they'd like to go onto. That means they have to spend the orange, and of course they will spend one because they have one courtier within the palace. Now you can see underneath that courtier there is a favor icon, and that means the player who puts a courtier over it will gain one favor. So yellow will gain the first favor of the game. Now as I mentioned, you can place more than one courtier, but if they were to put another one down, that would cost two of the associated resource, and currently they just have a single tan resource, so they are not in a position to be able to afford another courtier. The last thing I'd like to say about these is that they will stay on their placed spot for the rest of the game. So, yellow is done with their turn, and they can just save this resource for a future turn. This means it's our turn, and I think let's place over here. Now, in particular, I would like to activate the mosque, and there are two mosque icons within this row. So let's go with this one, I think, and there is obviously no building there, which means we can place one of our own. The next thing that we do is generate resources. This is going to give us one orange resource, and then, of course, we have another building within the active row, so that is going to generate resources, which will give us one tan. Now, as I said, I want to do a mosque action, so let's activate the board action printed on our activated tile. With this in mind, let's focus over here on the mosque, and as you can see, this is a track that goes from the bottom all the way up to the top. 
Down here, there are four different arrows, and the first time you activate the musk, you are going to place a new disc down and essentially move it up on the track. Now, we can move this as far up the track as we can afford and want to. Currently, we have an orange and a tan resource, so I think let's start over here and spend this orange resource. That means we can move our token up here, and the first player to put their token on any of these spots with a camel can then take this camel. We already have a camel in our area, so we now have two of these in our personal supply. And as I said, we can continue to spend resources if we want to. Well, we do have a tan resource, and the next cost is tan, so let's spend this, and that lets us move our token up to here. Now, it is worth noting, you will only ever have one token on this track as it goes up, and players are allowed to have their same token on the same location as an opponent, and there are no penalties or bonuses when that happens. Now, every time we go to a new space on this mosque track, we are going to gain the associated benefit. This space right over here means we can take one of these upgrades and place it down onto any building site on the board. Now, I talked about this before. This makes it so that that building site now generates the wild white resource instead of the resource that was printed on the tile. Now, obviously, I think we should put this onto a tile that has one of our buildings on it, and I think we'll put it right over here. So that means in the future, every time this is either activated or within the active row, we will then generate one white resource. This also means if this is within the active row of one of our opponents, when they activate a tile that has our building on it, we will also generate a white resource. So having these upgrades down is certainly a good thing. Now at this point, if we could afford it, we could continue moving up this track, but unfortunately we are out of resources. Now before we move on, I would like to talk about some of the other benefits that are on this track. As you can see, the next benefit right here will give you one favor down on the palace track. After that, this gives you one of these upgrades. You can select the one that you want, and you can place that down onto a tile that does not have an upgrade already, and that tile will then generate that associated resource in addition to the one that's printed on that tile. Moving on, once you arrive here, you can take one of these scoring tiles, and these will give you three points for every one of your buildings on the associated action type during each of the game's scorings. After that, this effect lets you put a soldier down onto any city that does not have an upgrade. As you can see, this upgrade covered up that soldier spot, so we could not place it there, but if we placed it over there, for example, then that specific building site would be immune from the next Mongol raid. Obviously, we haven't gotten there just yet, and we can now move on, where you can see this action lets you immediately place a courtier into the palace without paying any cost. After that, this is going to give you another favor. This right here will let you build a wall at no cost, or a gate at no cost. And finally, this up here will give you four victory points for every building that you have on a tile that shows the mosque action. It's also worth noting, when you reach these last four spots, you will generate the associated number of victory points when you enter those locations. Well, our turn is done, and it looks like the round has now come to an end, so it's now time to move our masters. The yellow player goes first. They currently don't have any camels, so they must go here. And then we get to go. Now, if we wanted to go first, that would just cost us one camel, but I think I'm okay going second for the time being. So we'll go here, then blue will go there, and it's now time to move into the third round of the year. For the second round in a row, blue gets to go first, and they've decided to move over here, and they would like to activate this tile. It does not have any player buildings on it, so they can build one of their own, and then when they generate resources, this will give them a teal, and then this is within the active row, so that will give them a tan resource. So they can take these resources, and now they are at the fourth step of their turn where they take an action. Now I haven't mentioned it before, but if you have the camel market within your active row, then before or after you take your action, you can visit the camel market. Now when you do this, you can either take all of the camels that are currently on the market, or you can place a single camel onto one of the currently empty bonuses to take that associated reward. Currently, Blue does have one camel, and they've decided to visit the camel market before their action, and they're going to place it right over here, and that will let them take a wild resource from the supply. So they can add this into their area, and before we move on, I'd like to point out the other icons. This one right here will give you one favor, that gives you one scroll, and lastly, this one right here lets you take any spice card from the spice row, and if it has a camel on it, then you get that camel. Once again, you are not allowed to take a new spice with this action unless your position on the influence track allows it. After visiting the camel market, Blue would now like to build walls. Currently, they have three resources, and they could potentially build three walls if they wanted to, although it looks like they are just going to build two. 
they're going to start by spending this tan resource, and that means they can build the last of the single tan walls. Before they place this, they are going to build another wall, and they'll spend their teal in order to construct one of the single-cost teal walls. Now, once again, they could spend this to build another wall, but they have decided to save this for now. Now that these walls are paid for, they can construct them around the city. They're going to put the first one over here, and that means they have to look at the next two tiles in the direction of that wall, and there is one of their buildings. They're going to get one influence for their buildings and two for every one of their opponents, so in this case, that will give them a single influence. After that, they have decided they're actually going to help us out a bit. They're going to place this over here, and that wall is likely going to help us with the oncoming Mongol invasion. Now, once again, I'll talk about the Mongols in greater detail later, but for now, you can see that the next two spots over here each have an opposing building on them for the blue player, and each of those is going to give them two influence. So by putting this over here, they are helping us out with the next Mongol raid, but they are also getting four influence for themselves, which is not a bad thing at all. So that's going to bring them one, two, three, four spaces up on this track. And when we focus in a little bit, you can see they are at a spot where they can hold up to two different types of spices. Currently, blue does not have any spices, but they are certainly planning on getting some in the near future. Well, at this point, blue is done with their action, but before they end their turn, they would like to take a contract. Now, I haven't talked about these just yet, and you are actually allowed to take a contract at any point during your turn if you can afford it. Now, there are a few different things that come into play when taking contracts, and I'll start things off by saying the blue player would like to take this contract here. Now, as you can see, the very first thing on the top says you have to spend a resource of any color. Now, they have a wild white resource, so that counts as any color, and this might not seem like the best use of a wild resource, but they've still decided to do this. So they can spend that one resource, and then in order to complete this contract, they have to place two scrolls onto it, as well as one common or rare good. When we look down at their area, you can see they do have two scrolls and a common good, so they can put them right on top and put this over here. Now it's important to note that they cannot move these tokens from this contract for the rest of the game, but they all still count for all other purposes like scoring or taking new breakthroughs. So if they took two more scrolls, they would have four altogether, even though these scrolls are now committed to completing this contract. Now the final thing that they have to have in order to complete this contract is the appropriate level of influence. As you can see, this card shows a one, and that means you have to have at least two influence in order to take that type of contract. When we look down this track, you can see there is a space for a two and a three, and these are associated with the higher cost contracts. When we focus out, you can see there are two stacks that need the one, two stacks that need the two, and two stacks that require the three, and currently the blue player is just one influence away from having enough to get one of the second level contracts. Now, each of these is going to cost a common and a rare good, as well as a scroll, so obviously the blue player isn't close to getting to those, but they are certainly trying to work towards more contracts. Now, at this moment, they have completed their contract, which means they can take the associated rewards. This right here says they can gain one favor, which will bring them up to one on the favor track, and then in the top right corner, this says they can get five victory points. It looks like these are actually the first points of the game, so they will go up to five. That's finished the blue player's take a contract action, but before we move on, I would like to point out that each of these has a stack of cards, and the cost to complete them is the same within those stacks, but the amount of victory points that you get will lower as these get taken. So the next one of this type will be only three victory points. Now you may have noticed that within the ones, the cost to take the contract are the same, but the reward is slightly different, and that is the same for each of these sets. There is one side that lets you place a soldier down into the city, and the other lets you gain a favor, and there is the same two options for all of the contract types. Well, blue is done, which means it's time for us to go, but before we take our turn, I would like to mention that the next thing I'm planning on teaching you is what happens once we have completed a full year of the game. Now, if you'd like to skip ahead and see how that works right now, you can go to the timestamp in the top corner, or you can stick around as we play through the third and fourth round of the first year of the game. All right, let's now take our turn. When we move our master, we can go to any of these four spots, and I think we should certainly go to one of these two, because that would put another one of our buildings within the active row. And in particular, let's go with this one right here, that way we are going to get a wild resource instead of an orange one. Next up, we have to select one of these tiles, and I would rather not select this one, because of course if we select a different one, we will generate more resources and put more of our buildings down. 
Now I do think going to the caravansary is a good idea. So I think let's activate this tile. That means we can put one of our buildings down since it is currently empty. And then we will generate a single teal resource and a white wild resource from our upgraded building. After that, let's visit the caravansary where we can pick up more spices. Now, if you remember, we can spend as many resources as we want, but they all have to be the same. And every resource lets us take a spice. Currently, we have some pepper and we have no influence on the track, which means we are not in a position to take another type of spice. Now, we can see out here that there is one pepper on the track and no others. So that means realistically, the only thing we can do is take a single spice. So let's spend our teal and hold on to this wild resource for another action in the future. Now, whenever we buy, we can take a card that has a camel on it or a card next to a card with a camel. And we also have the ability to place our own camels down, starting with the farthest card without a camel and going in to gain access to more cards. But obviously, we don't have to do that right now. We can save our camels and then buy this spice for that one teal resource. As soon as we do that, we now have a pair of the pepper. And the bonus for having a pair lets us place another one of these wild resource upgrades down. Now we can take this here, and I think let's place it right over there. So that way in the next round, if we are able to activate this spot right over here, we'll get two wild resources. At this point, we are done with our actions. We can slide all of these cards down and then reveal another spice. And at this point, we are done with our turn. This means yellow can go. After considering their options, they want to go over here, and they're going to activate this spot. That's going to put one of their own buildings down, and then they're going to generate a purple as well as a tan resource, because this is their active row. After that, they are going to activate the board action on the tile they chose, which lets them progress up the mosque track. Currently, they have two tan resources and a purple. One of the tan came from a previous turn, and they are going to spend a tan to start things off in order to go over here. That's going to give them a camel, and then they can spend a purple to move on to this spot, and that will give them an upgrade. Now, they've decided to place this right over here, and then they do have one more resource left, but unfortunately, they need to spend a teal resource next to move up again instead of the tan that they have, so they are going to once again hold on to an extra tan at the end of their turn. With that completed, yellow is done with their turn, so now we can move on to the next round. This means yellow will be third, and they do have a camel that they could spend to try and go second, but they're feeling pretty confident that their opponents aren't going to go where they want to go. Uh, next up, blue can go, and they don't have any camels, so they must go in second, and that means we get to go first in the next round of the game. Now, obviously, we have five different options available to us, but the one that is very much calling to me is to go right over here, because that puts both of these upgrades into our active zone. Now we could activate either of these, but I think it's even better to select one of the two spots that does not have a building just yet. And in particular, I think let's go here because that lets us visit the library to take some scrolls. Now this does not have a building yet, so we can place one of our own there. And then when we generate resources, we look for the red buildings within the active zone. And this one is going to give us an orange. And then both of these are going to give us the wild white resource. So we can add all three of these to the one white resource that we had already. And that brings us to four resources total. Next up, like I said, I want to visit the library to buy scrolls because this is going to work out very well for us. Whenever we do this action, the most we can do for that single action is buying four scrolls. But of course that would cost four different resources. Now we have an orange here, but then we have three of the wilds. So that effectively counts as four different resources. And that means we can spend all of this to take four scrolls from the supply. Now, as soon as we take two scrolls from the supply, we can immediately take a first level breakthrough. If you remember, each of these gives us a once per turn single discount on a resource for the associated type of action. Now we already have a couple of spices, so I think getting more spices is probably a good thing for us, even though at the moment there are no pepper on the row, which means we can't actually take any of these until we gain four influence. Fortunately, we can gain influence by building walls that protect our opponent's buildings, and I think we'll probably do that soon. If any of these gave us a discount on walls, I think we'd take it, but that is not the case. So I think we are still going to take the one that gives us a discount for future caravansary actions. So we can put these back, and then of course we only have two scrolls yet, and we bought four, so we can take two more. And the moment we hit four, we can then take one of these second level breakthroughs. Now these let us once per turn turn a specific type of resource into effectively a wild resource. And right now when we look out to the map, we can see that our buildings create teal, orange, or the wild white resource already. 
Now, I think with that in mind, we should take the one that converts teal or the orange. And when we consider that we might want to place a building here to activate that huge row in the future, uh, let's take the teal one. So that means for the rest of the game, once per turn, we can count a teal resource as if it was wild. We can put the rest of these back down onto the board. So we can place these here, and it's worth noting with these four scrolls, we now have enough scrolls to complete two of these first level contracts. Now we of course don't have the goods, the resources, or the influence to pull either of these off, but that is certainly something we would be paying attention to as we went throughout the game, trying to complete these as soon as we can to make good use out of the scrolls that we already have in front of us. Next up, the blue player can go, and they would really like to visit the mosque, and unfortunately, there are no mosque actions in this active area, which has two of their buildings. Fortunately, there is a mosque here, and they have one active building there, so they are going to place on here and activate this spot. Now, it's going to produce a building of theirs, and then when they generate resources, this is going to give them a tan, and that will give them teal. After that, they can activate the mosque, and this is the first time they are doing that, so they are going to add a disc down. Now they're going to begin by spending their teal resource. That means they can move along this path and take this camel. And then they currently have a tan resource, but the next one costs an orange. Fortunately for them, they have this first level breakthrough for the mosque. That lets them once per turn get a discount of one resource when doing the mosque action. So they can use this discount to pay for the orange, which will move them there. And then they can place this wild upgrade tile down onto a building tile. After considering their options, they're going to put this one right over here. And at this point, they still have a tan resource left, and that is the cost for the next step on this track. So they're going to spend this, and then move over here, where they will gain one favor. That will bring them to this spot here, and as soon as they arrive there, that will give them one victory point. So they will go up to six. Well, at this point, the yellow player can go, and they're going to go all the way over here to activate this row, which isn't a big surprise considering they have a couple of buildings up there. Now, they would like to activate this tile here. That is going to put one of their own buildings down, and then they will generate a teal, a white wild resource, and an orange resource. So they can add these to the single tan resource they already had, and now when they go to take their action, they are indeed going to activate the mosque. When we look at the track, we can see the next spot for them is going to cost a teal, so they can move this there, and that will give them a favor, which will bring them up to two favor total, and that gets them a point. So they will go up to one point total. Next up, they can spend an orange resource to move up once again on the mosque track, and that will let them take one of these bonus resource upgrades. After considering the options, they are going to take this one, which lets them make an extra tan resource, and they are going to add that right over here. That means in the future, when this activates for them, they are going to get a tan as well as an orange resource. So these will go back over here, and at this point, yellow is not done, because they have a white and a tan resource still in their hand. Now, they've had this tan for a couple of turns, and they are now going to spend this for this next step, which costs a tan and a teal. Obviously, the white is wild, so that will count for the teal, and that means they can move over here and then take one of these scoring tile options. Now, these will give them three victory points during every scoring for each building of theirs on the associated type of building tile. Out of all these options, they've decided to go with this one, which will give them three points for each building on a wall construction building site. So this will go right over here, and that finished a good turn for the yellow player. Now the round is also coming to an end because all players have taken their action. So blue will go up here. They have a camel, but they've decided they are not going to spend it to manipulate the turn order. After that, we can go. We have two camels, and I think going forward, it would be nice to go first in the next round instead of second. So I think let's spend a camel in order to jump the second spot and go first. That means the yellow player will go second, and they will get a camel, which they aren't too upset about. Alright, at this point we have completed a full year because the Masters have gone all the way around the track, and they are back in the top left corner. Now, if we look down over here to the round track, you can see when we complete the first year, we will then have a scoring. When we focus in, you can see this icon matches up with that icon within the palace. And this means each player has to spend one favor for every courtier that they have within the palace. At the moment, that's just the yellow player, so they would spend one favor. And it's worth noting, if you land on a victory point spot going in the left direction, you do not get those points again. But in the future, if yellow then gains another favor, they will once again gain that victory point. Now, it's worth noting that you must pay favor for every courtier that you have, even if you don't like the amount of scoring that they are potentially going to give you. Now, once you have paid your favor, you will then score for each courtier that you paid favor for. 
So it's possible you might have more courtiers in here than favor, and in that case, you have to pick and choose which courtiers will be activated by the spent favor. Obviously, in this example, yellow can easily pay for their one courtier, so now they can score this. Now, this area says they are going to get one victory point for every step up they are on the mosque track. Currently, we can see they are one, two, three, four, five steps on the track, so that one courtier is going to give them five points. It's worth noting players are allowed to have multiple courtiers in specific scoring spots, and if they had two in here, then that would have been five times two or ten points right now. Obviously, that's not the case, so now they can take their five points, which will tie them at six points with the blue player. Now, as I said, every courtier that had a favor paid for it can score, but in this game, in the first year, only one courtier went down. Um, now, if we had other courtiers in here, we would score for them, and let's talk about how these specifically work. Now, let's pretend the blue player had a courtier right over here, and they paid for it. Now, that will give one point for every common or rare good that that player has, even if they are already committed to a contract. So if the blue player had placed this here, then that would be worth one times one or one victory point for them. Uh, that's probably part of the reason they didn't invest in this, because right now that does not score very well. Now, after that, there is this spot, and if we pretended that we put a courtier down over here, then we would get one point for every spice card that we have at the moment. Currently, we have two spice cards, so that would have been worth two points to us, and that might have been worth it, placing this over here, but we decided it made more sense to try and go for things like these breakthroughs in the first year of the game. There are still two more years to the game to try and place courtiers and get a lot more points for each of them. The last one over here is going to give points for the scrolls. This one would have been a lot better for us because if we had this over here, that would be worth one point for every scroll that we had, and we currently have four. And once again, if you have scrolls committed to a contract, they still score for the purposes of this palace scoring up here. Now, obviously, we did not do this, and potentially we should have tried to make that happen, but you only get four actions within each year, and you have to prioritize what you want to do with each of them. Now, at this point, we have finished scoring all of the palace courtier options which means we can now score for our buildings. Now, I haven't mentioned this just yet, but in each of the three scorings in the game, players are going to get one point for every building they have on the map. As you can see, each of us have four buildings, so in this scoring, each of us would get four victory points. That means yellow and blue would be up to ten, and we would be up to four. After that, all players who have these scoring tiles that you can pick up on the mosque track will then score for them. Currently, that's just the yellow player, and this will give them three points for every building they have on a building site that has the wall action. As you can see, they have one of those, but they don't have a second, so that means that this one building is going to be worth three more points to them. So that would bring them up to 13. The final thing players can potentially score for is reaching the final spot on the mosque track. As you can see, that shows a four-point bonus for every building that you have on a mosque action type, and you may have noticed that that action did not show up on the other scoring tiles on this track. Obviously, no player has reached the end of the mosque track, so no one is going to score for this, and at this point, we have finished the scoring phase. This means it's time to move the year tracker forward to show that the second year of the game is starting. Now, this year plays the same as the first, with the exception of, once the year is over, there will be a Mongol invasion before the scoring, and likewise, after the third year, there is a Mongol invasion before the final scoring of the game. Now, at this point, I'd like to talk about how the Mongol invasion works in greater detail. For this, let's focus out on the city. Now, the Mongols are going to raid each of the four different sides of the city, and for every single position that's not protected by walls or soldiers, players are going to lose that building or they will have to pay a ransom. Uh, let's, for example, start over here and say the Mongols begin by invading in this direction. Now, when they invade, they are going to attack up to two tiles, and walls will defend against their attack. That means right now, if the Mongols started over here, then both of these buildings would be protected by this wall, and that building is protected by that wall there. However, this and that building are not protected from the attack. Now, when you get attacked by the Mongols, you can either pay the ransom or lose that building, which obviously isn't great, considering buildings give you extra resources when they're in your active area, and they can give you victory points. Now, the ransom to pay for a building is going to be a resource that that building site creates. So as you can see, the ransom for this site would be a purple, and the ransom for that site would be a tan resource. Now, if there are upgrades on the tile, then that will increase your options for the ransom. If there is one of these white resource upgrades, then you can spend any resource to pay the ransom. And if there is one of these plus resources, you can spend either of those options to pay the ransom. Now, it's important to note that when you pay ransom, you need to leave it on the building because the Mongols are going to raid all of the different sides. 
So let's, for example, say that yellow paid the ransom for this, but blue did not pay the ransom for that. So in this case, that building would be removed from the board. Now the Mongols would raid from this side, and there is no protection at all. So that means all of these buildings would be hit, and players would have to pay a ransom. Now let's just pretend for the purpose of example that we had a soldier over here, and the blue player had a soldier right over there. Now every single building site that has a soldier on it is defended from the Mongol raids in every direction, so we wouldn't have to worry about either of these, but over here the blue player would be in trouble. Now in this case they could spend any resource, so let's say that they would do that, they might spend a tan to put it down there to protect that spot. Moving on, the Mongols would then raid over here, and this site would be defended by the soldier, and both of these buildings are defended from this direction. But then when the Mongols finally raid from the top, you can see neither of these buildings are now protected. So as you can see, most of the buildings out here on the map either need a soldier on them or two walls in order to protect from that spot. So in this case, obviously all three of these of ours would need to pay a ransom or be destroyed, and the same goes with these three yellow. But you'll notice this ransom was already paid earlier, so this spot is protected from the Mongols raiding in from the top. Now with these Mongol raids in mind, you have a much better idea why you want to place these walls out, and you should also see now why these gates are so expensive. They are all three resources, and they can only go into the middle spots, and the reason for that is because the buildings in these middle row and columns are only ever going to be affected by a raid in a single direction. So if, for example, there was a gate right over here, then that would protect both of these buildings from this direction, but obviously when the Mongols come in from the other directions, that does not actually reach those spots. So a single section protects these instead of two like normal, which is why these gates are so expensive to build. Once the Mongol raid is done, every soldier on the map will be removed whether or not they protected that spot from the Mongols. Well, as I said before, the game is now ready for the second out of three years, but at this point I am now going to stop playing the game, and the next thing that I'd like to talk about is what happens once the game is over. Now there is going to be a standard scoring just like the other two years, and after that standard scoring is done, we will do final scoring. The only thing players do for this is score up the points on their sets of different spices. Now as you can see at the bottom of each of these cards, it shows you that you will get 1, 3, 6, or 10 victory points for each set of different types of spices. So in this example, where we have 3 pepper, 2 cinnamon, and 1 juniper, we have a set of 3 different spices, which would be worth 6 points right here. This is a set of two different spices, which is worth three points. And finally, we have a set of one different spice, which is worth one point. So in this example, we would add 10 victory points to our score, and all players will do this simultaneously. Once we are done scoring for our spices, we will have our final scores, and the player with the most victory points will be the winner. Now, if there happens to be a tie once the game is over, the player with the most favor will break that tie. If there is still a tie, then the most influence will break it, and if there is still a tie, then the player who is farthest forward in the final turn order on the map will break the tie in their favor. Well, at this point, I have now covered just about all of the rules to the game, which means this tutorial has come to a close. I hope that you've enjoyed learning how to play Merv. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.